I mean, maybe maybe you give them a little bit of credit for the fact that they, you know, it's, it's like they found money on the street and then they treated themselves to like a nice dinner or something like that. So nice. maybe yeah. we don't have to, to, to harp on it too much. But if you think about tackle. Welcome to another episode of the Football Analytics Show. My name is Ed Fang, your host. And on this episode, I'm thrilled to have Kevin Cole back on the show. He's a football analytics expert and the creator of Unexpected Points. Among other topics in this episode, we talk about his overall thoughts on the 2023 NFL Draft. And this leads us into some of his work on positional value. Then we dig into some of the teams and how they did. And this includes Houston, Philadelphia, and Detroit. And finally, we talk a little bit about the NFL futures market for 2023. The Football Analytics Show is brought to you by the Power Ranks Sports Betting Newsletter. This is a free service that strives to be three things. One, valuable. Two, concise. Three, entertaining. Every Saturday, I'll send you my curated list of sports betting tips and analytics. To sign up for this free service, go to thepowerrank.com. That is my site for better sports betting information based on data and analytics. Once again, that's thepowerrank.com. Joining me on this episode of the Football Analytics Podcast is Kevin Cole. He is a football analytics expert, and he's the founder of Unexpected Points, which is a newsletter and a podcast. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ed. I think I've been on here, I don't know, how, how many times now? Five times, maybe? I, I'm not no, sure. No, more, so. more than that. More than that. More than that? Okay. Hopefully, hopefully I'm the, the record holder, but I know that it's probably twice a year we check in. We're able to figure everything else. I, I I bring you back. I think you were on my pod a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure we'll talk more th- this summer about what's going on. A little bit of a downtime in the NFL season, but I think it's really interesting to try to process all this all this new stuff that's happened and sort through all the narratives and everything else uh, coming at us post draft. I personally don't think there is a downtime for the NFL. I feel like yeah, we should always be true. always be grinding away at stuff. And uh, later I will ask you how much the draft really matters but um yeah no I'm, I'm excited to actually talk more often on the podcast uh you know just just have more conversations uh more in exchange of an ideas which i think will help both of us and and all of our followers let's do it all right so kevin we had the draft last week 2023 did you have any kind of big takeaways for how teams uh you know, made their did their decision making during the draft, trading up, trading down, staying put, drafting positions, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I do this analysis where I'm looking specifically at trying to measure positional value benefits or detriments to different picks. And one interesting thing was looking at what when the position is drafted, what draft position versus kind of like the average value that you would get. And the value here is the equivalent player value on the free market in other words on like a second contract or on a free agency contract versus how much they're going to get paid on their rookie contracts and what i thought was interesting was that wait wait hold on one you know, hold, it, hold on one sec so your yeah. measure is how much the second contract is worth compared to the first contract so obviously Correct. if that if that ratio is high then you made a really good pick and Correct. if that ratio Correct. is low I mean, it's, it's or non existent yeah, i mean it yeah, it, it's similar to the methodology that goes all the way back to when the professors, Cade Massey and Richard Thaler, they wrote their paper, The Loser's Curse. Um, I think they were using approximate value and trying to figure out through some ways there too. But the real foundation is this con- concept of surplus value. So maybe I'll just break that down real, real yeah, quickly. Yeah, so, for sure. So, so, so I'm looking at historically players, what happens on their second contract? Do they wash out of the league. So that's a zero, basically kind of like a zero value almost. Uh, Are they signed for 5 million a year, 10 million a year, 15 million a year, making some adjustments on the fact that certain players in certain positions provide more of their value probably on their first contract than then on their second contract, like running back. Um, Others would flip around the other way. 
but then trying to get an idea of how much that player is worth, because that's really what rookie draft picks do for you in a, in a hard salary cap league. I know people like to talk about the, the, the ways you can fudge the salary cap. It's really the contracts that you can fudge as opposed to fudging the salary cap. I mean, you can't spend more than a certain amount. Uh, you can carry some forward. You can, you, you can, you know, you can spend over if you've carried some forward in the past, but generally like over a 10 year period, these teams are not going to be able to spend more than a certain amount on an annual basis. Um, so you, there's a lot of trickery that comes with the contracts, but you can only spend a certain amount. So what you're getting out of the draft more than anything else um, you are acquiring players that you're going to have a long-term benefit from, but most of the benefit you're getting from draft picks outside of, let's say, quarterback or some other premium positions, most of the benefit you're getting is you're just getting cheap labor, basically. You're getting players who, you know, in the first round are probably worth $10 million a year as far as what their equivalent play would be on the free market. Yet, depending upon where they're being drafted, you're paying them somewhere between $10 million a year if they're the first player overall. And if they're at the end of the round, you're paying them something more like $3 million a year. So that delta, that that, you know, that benefit that you're getting is allowing you to build a better roster underneath the salary cap. Right, exactly. So you talked a little bit about, you know, the original Thaler Massey study and they did it differently with the prox- AV, right? Approximate value. I believe that's yeah. that's a metric that started with uh, uh, Pro Football Reference. That's correct. Right, right, right. right. So, yep. so, they were also translating that into dollars, though, too. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. If I remember right, like the original study, like the peak of the surplus value was like towards the end of the first round. And I feel like when I was looking at yeah. what your work did, it looks like the peak for a lot of these positions is like pick 12. Is that correct, or am I getting something wrong? No, that that's correct. Yeah, I, mean, I think there has been a little bit of an adjustment there um, for what's happened. I mean, there's a couple different things that have happened. The the um, updates to the 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 agreements and the different um, salary structures for rookies have changed a bit. It's not as top heavy, although it's still top heavy versus what we had seen in the past. So that has helped boost some of the values earlier. But at the same time, you know, it does peak not at pick number one. So right. that would be right. like the controversial right. thing and you're looking at. And it's not because the players who are drafted first are not the best players. You know, they are the best players. It's just over a again, so a four year contract for the number one pick for for Bryce Young is going to be forty one point two million dollars over four years. If you go down to the twelfth pick, and this we're talking about being like a more of a sweet spot for this year, the twelfth pick it's nineteen nineteen million dollars over four years. So it's less than half the cost you're going down to that quickly. Now, in order to get to half the cost of the twelfth pick, you have to go all the way into the forties before you start to get half like the equivalent decline there. So I think the 12th player, as opposed to the player who's being drafted 46, there's going to be a lot bigger difference there than there's going to be the difference between the player taken first and the player taken at 12th. I mean, presuming it's not quarterbacks we're talking about, right? In a lot of these situations, and that can change the dynamic. Great. So based on the study that you did, looking at different positions, what were your takeaways from this draft? So that teams are... I don't know if they're getting smarter or not, but again, when I'm looking at historical norms for how much picks are worth on average, and then I look at the particular position that was being picked, how much that position is worth, and I was netting all these out and then aggregating it for the entire league, you would look at a positive overall surplus value teams were getting based upon their positional decisions, which... You know, it probably can't be true. So I tried to normalize that when 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 estimating these teams, but it just shows versus what teams had done the previous 10 years, 15 years of the data that I have here, that they were on average getting more value out of the picks than they had in the past. And that's primarily because they were focusing on tackle, edge rushers, cornerbacks. Uh, defensive interior players who can rush the passer wide receivers with a few, you know, running a couple running back picks and a linebacker pick sprinkled in there that got a lot of hype. But outside of those few picks, it was all premium positions in the first round. So are they reading your work, these people in the NFL, or is it just a general notion that we understand how valuable coverage is? We understand you know, how predictable pass rush is and, and pressure rates and things like that. I mean, what, what do you think is going on? 
or was it just random? I, mean, I think it's a, uh, no, I don't think it's random. I think I think it's slowly moving in that direction. I mean, the draft has maybe been a little bit slower even than contract uh, values, and I think contract values do feed into the perception too. And I'm talking about like second contracts and and what they're being paid. I mean, if you think about it, like there's always talk about running back value, running back value. I mean that that that's done when it comes to second contracts almost i mean there there are random times the zeke contract was and that was back in what was it 2019 i guess that was probably the last time we had an extension where it was like clearly you were you were paying too much for for this extension now derrick henry it's like slightly more than maybe a franchise tag sort of amount same thing with maybe dalvin cook or alvin Kamara or christian mccaffrey it's not as bad as it's been before um, where, and also, contract-wise, quarterback values have gone way up as a percentage of the cap. Uh, wide receivers, we saw them go crazy over the last year as far as their value is concerned. Um, so all these different things are happening where that market has really moved in the direction of all the different analytical insights that we would have had. The draft doesn't move as quickly, I think, because people are very overconfident in their particular evaluations on these players. But it starts to filter in and teams notice and, and, you know, teams are smart. And even if they say, you know, I'm not sure this edge rusher is going to be good. But when an edge rusher is getting up close to 30 million dollars a year. Hey, you know, this is maybe maybe I need to make this edge rusher pick rather than going with this off ball linebacker. For sure. So it sounds like the NFL in general is getting smarter about positional value. And we see that in these second contracts. We see that in the free agency market. And because of that, teams are getting smart and saying, well, if I have to pay this edge rusher, however many millions on a second contract, let's try to get a good one on the cheap in the draft. Yeah, yeah. And it's harder to build your team now than maybe it had been in the past. I think it's actually gotten a lot tougher now, even if you are an analytically thinking type of person where you know, if, if you could have spent a lot less on quarterback, um, edge rusher, you know, great defensive interior guys, uh, wide receivers, you could have spent a lot less on them five years ago, which would have given you a lot more um, room to make mistakes in other areas and still be able to build a great team. It's just your margin of error is becoming lower now. So teams are going to have to adhere to this just because they're not going to have enough money on their cap if they spend these, uh, you know, running back picks in the first round. And then a couple years down the line, they're not going to, they're going to have to start cutting players or they're not going to be able to, they're going to have to let players go because they don't have the cap in order to resign them. Right. So let me understand that. So it's harder because you're paying quarterbacks and edge rushers more. That leaves yeah. you less to sign other players. And then so it's harder to fill out a full team. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. It's basically harder to harder to fill out a full team. And it's it's again, you're getting a huge, huge salary benefit if we're talking about this. I mean, when you re-sign almost any non-quarterback to a second contract, um, the value you're getting on that, I mean, you're getting a little bit of value if you're extending them versus free agency, because like you have better leverage, they, they can only negotiate with you, but you're not getting much value, um, out of those car- sort of contracts. So it's almost like table stakes to say, well, we got to resign our wide receiver now for $27 million a year or whatever it's going to end up being for these guys. And when you just have to do that, then a bigger and bigger portion of your team salary cap pie is being occupied by these players that you really can't get rid of. So you have to be better about maximizing the rest of your salary. Um, And the draft is a great way of doing that because you can get premium value at a very controlled cost. Interesting. Interesting. Awesome. Well, let's talk about what happened last Thursday. There's a ton of, ton of drama heading in to the draft with Houston at number two. We kind of knew Bryce Young was going number one. Thankfully he did. And uh, and then the number two pick, right? So this was a market in which I believe four different players were the favorite um, in, in, over the 48 hours before that pick was actually made. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then Houston traded away a boatload to get Arizona's pick at number three. Uh, they take Will, uh, Will Anderson at number three, the edge rusher. They take CJ Stroud, the quarterback, at number two, which was interesting because there were people who swore up and down that – It would not be Stroud. So I just want to get your general take on just everything that Houston did up until that third pick. Yeah. Okay. This is some speculation is built built into to my assessment and what they may have done here. But you know, people who are pretty connected to the organization, Lanzierline being one of them, others were hearing 
strong indication that the second pick was going to be either probably Will Anderson, but either Will Anderson or Tyree Wilson, a a edge rusher. And it, you know, again, a further layer of speculation is that that's who kind of like the coaching staff wanted to have. And we have the coaching staff of D'Amico Ryans coming in from San Francisco, you know, a team that just went to the NFC championship. Um, and who knows, could have won if not for an injury to Brock Purdy, who was Mr. Irrelevant of the previous draft. So I could see why maybe they wouldn't have the the strongest appreciation for needing to go get a quarterback. But it sounded like and that's why even Zerline had done this mock draft uh, weeks yeah. ago where he had them going Anderson, I think, two or, or Wilson, two, and then Wilson trading two. up. Yeah. Yeah. And then trading up from 12 to go get someone and everyone said he was crazy, but maybe an idea like that was actually on the board. And it sounds like ownership or someone else decided no, we, or, or they came to an organizational decision that it's too risky to do it this way. You know, we're getting feedback that Stroud's not going to last that long or whoever they may have been interested in even beyond Stroud was not going to last that long. So we have to use this pick on Stroud, but they were already, kind of invested in the fact that they were going to draft Will Anderson. They really, really wanted Will Anderson. So they said, oh, you know what? We got all this extra draft capital because of the trade of Deshaun Watson. So let's just go get Will Anderson too, even though it's a pretty absurd idea, assuming the draft capital that you needed to get him and the salary you're going to have to pay him um, to use that on an edge rusher. Interesting. So I I mean, did they kind of get fleeced for the what they had to give up to trade up to three for Arizona? Yeah, I mean, it's basically the equivalent of an early, you know, top, almost top five-ish sort of first round pick that they gave up to trade up from 12 to three. It's pretty, it's pretty much, it's pretty similarly in line with maybe what your expectations were. If you remember, San Francisco moved up from 12 to three a couple of years ago to get um, Trey Lance, and they gave up three first round picks. And those first round picks, if you assume the San Francisco, San Francisco 49ers are going to be pretty good. So the other two first round picks in the future are probably picks we're assuming are going to be in the 20s. I mean, this first round pick, uh, I mean, I may be undervaluing it. It may actually be worse than giving up an early first round pick because this is the Texans first, first round pick. This is the Texans right. third round pick next year. This was the first pick of the second round. Um that they are that they were giving up. Um, I guess it was the first pick. It was the it was the second pick of the second round, the thirty third pick, which would typically be the first pick of the second round. But this is a different year sure. because the Dolphins lost their first round pick. So they're giving up the thirty fourth pick in this draft, which is almost a first round pick, and their first round pick next year, and their third round pick next year. And that first round pick next year could be, and probably is likely to be, a first half of the round pick, and it could be who knows a top five pick. Sure, sure. So for a, for a, for a rusher edge rusher, I mean, that's quarterback. They spent very much at least what you would spend to trade up to get a quarterback in that situation. Right. So certainly not what you would have done. No, definitely, definitely not. That's why the grading on anything Houston does is I've seen some B's out there for what they've done. And I mean, that can only be your grade if you just completely ignore the uh, future ramifications of this of this trade i mean even the present ramifications in some ways if they took someone at 12 and then someone at 34 um i don't know you might get better value out of those two picks just alone without even worrying about the future picks that you gave up yeah for sure and then arizona trades up to six uh with detroit uh there was a lot of buzz that they were going to take paris johnson jr the offensive tackle out of ohio state at number three uh those odds went up great like a lot in in the 48 hours leading up to the draft so that might be the the guy that they wanted the guy that kyler murray wants to help protect him and then they get him at six anyway yeah yeah that that one i mean i don't know it's probably one that they did not need to make um but you, you're right you, i mean maybe maybe you give them a little bit of credit for the fact that they you know that it's, it's like they found money on the street and then they treated themselves to like a nice dinner or something like that. So nice. maybe yeah. we don't have to, to to harp on it too much. But if you think about tackle, it still looks to me like an overvaluation of your assessment because tackle was seen as being weak here. You had a group, whether it was Skaronsky, who may end up being a guard, so who knows, but like Skaronsky, um, Broderick Jones, who ended up going 14, 
Darnell Wright was seen as a little bit of a reach, but who knows by the by the Bears at 10. So if we if we look back to 12, if they would have stayed at 12, if the draft played out exactly how, how it would have, Paris Johnson might have been gone to either Chicago or Tennessee, but one of those tackles would have fallen. Broderick Jones, who was seen as being a pretty good pick by the Steelers at 14, I mean, he would have definitely still been there. So they would have gotten a tackle without having to have traded away any picks in that such situation. And they probably got a tackle where it would have been maybe a little bit worse chance of success, but close enough to a coin flip that it, it it's it, it would have been worth it. So I, I'm not big on the on the on the moving up, but I get it. Teams do not like to move out. I mean, this is the same thing that Miami Dolphins did, right? With the um with the Lance trade. They moved out and then they moved right back up. And they traded with the Eagles to go up and to be in position eventually to get Jalen Waddle. So teams like still getting one of those, like who they consider to be a blue chip player. I don't know if Paris Johnson was really a blue chip player in this draft, though. Interesting. So the the idea that this was kind of a weak offensive line class is pretty interesting, right? Because there there were a lot of them that ended up going in the top half of the first round. I guess you don't see any of them as elite prospects. Is that is that what you're saying? Well, it's it's tough. I mean, I don't think any of them were really seen as being on the level, for instance, as the I'm trying to think of what draft is. It was the 2019 draft where we had Werfs and then we had Mekhi Becton who ended up busting. And then we had um what's his name? Andrew Thomas. Uh, let me look up. Let me look right up. out of out uh, of Georgia. Yeah. So he well, he he ended up looking pretty rough his um his first year. Actually, I guess it was the 2020 draft. So he ended up looking, Andrew Thomas at four, ended up looking pretty rough, but now he's been pretty solid. And then the the Browns took Jedrick Will. So you had those four guys. I mean, I, I'm not 100% certain, but I bet if you looked at the draft grades for all four of those guys, they would have been higher than any tackle from, from this class. Interesting. So one of the things that happened with the offensive tackle was the Bears took Darnell Wright at 10, which I thought was interesting because they had the nine pick. But Philadelphia decided they wanted to trade up for one pick to yeah. get Jalen Carter when yeah. they knew Chicago was probably not going to take. Well, I guess I guess Chicago had been. Uh, I mean, Carter had been kind of mocked to, sh- to Chicago. Well, even when they had the I mean, topic, I think it's pretty right? obvious that that Chicago's not going to take them because they made the pick. So the only the only leverage Chicago had to make that trade, or the reason that they could say, "Well, we're going to trade this pick to someone else," um, right? They they could tell Philadelphia. We have another team who's interested in trading up who might be interested in trading up for Jalen Carter. So why don't you trade with us instead? And they knew they would still get Darnell Wright, uh, the guy they wanted at 10. Is it, I, I guess that worked. I don't know. That seems like well, that's the only reason, right? I mean, it, it's it, well, again, this goes back to I'm trying to think of an analogy for this one. The one pick trade up. First, of all, it happened twice in this draft, too, which mm-hmm. is interesting. Well, and then um, didn't Philly trade up one spot last year to get. No, they traded up two spots, but two spots. it's close. <laughs> they traded up from 13, 15 to 13. Again, um, that was a play oh. where they thought they thought that that was like a teardrop, I would say, right at that point. So that's why they thought they had to trade up. And I don't know. I mean, I, that's one of the things I think you could be slightly critical of the Eagles if you wanted to be. The fact that they moved up to get Jordan Davis. Uh, they moved up a couple of picks thinking that that he was going to be the teardrop. I think here, again, they're they're willing to kind of like burn a fourth round pick or a cu- I think last year in order to make this trade up, they traded a fourth and two fifths to go up um, yeah. two spots. So they've been willing to do that. They did it with Andre Dillard a number of years ago. And, you know, sometimes it works and you can look genius. And sometimes with Andre Dillard, like it it was it was seen as being genius at the time because they jumped over the Texans who needed an offensive tackle also, but it didn't work out. So it's one of these things that we look back and we probably make a bigger deal based upon whether it works out or not, because we all still or a lot of people still still laugh about the Bears giving San Francisco 49ers a handful of picks in order to move up to draft Mitchell Trubisky. Just one oh, pick. Right. You know, they just moved up one. They just moved right. up one pick. And if that Trubisky pick worked out, or if it was Howie Roseman doing it, maybe we wouldn't be as critical of it. But obviously, it didn't work out, and then everyone thought it was crazy to do so. But it's a similar, similar um, game theory type of motivation here. The game theory yeah. is: Hey, we're going to trade out with somebody. If it's not you, it could be someone else. And if it's someone else, they could take the player who you want. So even though you're only moving up one pick and you know we don't want that player, someone else could want that player. That's fascinating. 
So I've lost a bunch of money on these trade-ups by the Eagles. Uh, everyone had Jordan Davis going to Baltimore. And um, so I had some money well, there. You know, Baltimore had the next pick. So exactly. They were so they jumped, above. they jumped Baltimore, right? Yeah, they jumped Baltimore. So I think that's why so, they thought they had to do it. But I would still say it's overconfidence. I still say there's probably, you know, I mean, we'll see. Jordan Davis could be a fantastic, right. fantastic prospect. And I do think there was a positional value tier kind of drop right there so maybe it was the right way to go if you think about like the real high value positions um because right after that it ended up being kyle hamilton who is a safety and then it was a guard next to the texans got the texas and then it was (laughs) and then like the wide receivers the guys who seem to be in the top tier wide receivers are already gone so Jahan dodson and Traylon burks went after that so i guess it could have been like one of those guys type of pick but um yeah, th- that one I like probably a little bit more than moving up one pick, especially when we're talking about Jalen Carter, who seems to have some red flags that are making him fall in this draft, which are probably legitimate. Interesting. Well, let's talk about that in a sec. Just closing the loop on this. Um, so I was reading some stuff from Evan Silva, and he's like, I love Darnell Wright, 14-1 to 1 to go number nine. I think the Bears might take him. The odds for that, I don't know. They must have gone to like 4-1. to one. I didn't have a ton of money on it, but like, Philadelphia trading up screwed that right because Chicago probably would have taken right at number nine and everything kind of fell in place right so um okay let's talk about Philly uh there are some uh legal issues with Jalen Carter I believe that's what you're talking about however everyone thinks that maybe he's the most talented player in this draft and the Eagles got a steal there and then they take uh they take uh Nolan Smith with with I believe the 30th pick uh, a player that was rumored that they might have taken with the 10th pick had he been there. So did, you know, should Philadelphia fans be making their Super Bowl plans right now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they can make Super Bowl plans mostly because they were the, the they should be, at least in my opinion, the big Super Bowl favorite out of the NFC. It's kind of weird that San Francisco is right up there with them when you kind of don't even know who their quarterback is going to be right. at this point, uh, but they're very close. And the NFC is so weak that for any, for any team, if any team is going to make Super Bowl plans, I'd say the Eagles are probably looking pretty good. They're really sure. pushing, you know, they're pushing a lot into this year too. the way they, the way they structure their contracts, all these void years that they just kick, they're kicking the can way down the road. Um, this, this, um, Jalen Hurts contract is is insane how they're just structured it with all these different bonuses in the future to continue to amortize those out into the future. But uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm getting off the topic here a little bit, but when no, it comes to great. these, Do it. when they come to these uh, specific picks, so the research shows this is something that goes into my kind of grading. The research shows, and I think the logic shows, and I'll go through both cases. So the research shows, and this is mostly research that, that I mean, it's some that I've double checked and I've kind of um, replicated, but also Timo Risque over at at PFF has looked at this and said consensus big board. Where were they ranked? And again, these are players that you just mentioned who who they drafted in this draft. Darnell, I mean, um, Jalen Carter was more of a top five type of pick right. by consensus big boards. And then Nolan Smith, um, depending, you know, anywhere from probably like the middle of the teens, maybe earlier on some people's big boards. So when when that happens, when there is a difference where, you know, you're getting them a lot later than where the big boards say they should have gone. Um, there's no empirical evidence that they perform better than the expectation based upon their draft position. So it's essentially saying hmm. where they've drafted is, is right. As far as how they perform. Wait, hold, hold, hold on. So, people... Yeah. Okay. So this is fantastic. Cause this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you, right? Are, I mean, we know that draft position is predictive of how these players do, right? I think you were the mm-hmm. first one yeah. to tell me that long time ago. And kind of my question was maybe should we be looking at consensus big boards instead right and so it sounds like the question the answer is no on average yeah i mean i think there's it's it's asymmetrical so when a player is a steal if you don't class them as steal like these guys taken after where the big board says we don't have there, there's no empirical evidence that they um outperform their draft position however oh if a player is taken before where the big boards have them ranked uh they do underperform their draft expectation so Hmm. that's the empirical evidence it's kind of like if a team reaches let's say like the raiders have been famous for the last few years um (laughs) that's probably not a good thing by the empirical evidence and if 
they scoop up a player who everyone's claiming to be a steal. And that's kind of like most often what people are grading these drafts on. It's actually not really a thing. It's not really a thing. Now, so that's the empirical evidence. And I think the logic is very strong too in a couple of different ways. The first way is who needs to make an error? Like who needs to be wrong about their evaluation for a reach? Like if you're taking a player earlier than you should be, only one team needs to be wrong, right? One team is taking them. We don't know where the other teams oh, have yeah. been ranked, right? but at least theoretically, any team can trade up, right? So like theoretically, every team has this player ranked lower than wherever you're taking them every single time. And if you're taking them way above the consensus big board, that's probably some indication that you might be even further ahead of where, of where other teams are. Now, the flip side is, let's say for Nolan Smith here, right? So Nolan Smith is taken with the 30th pick overall. He's an edge player, you know, that's it's valued by, by teams. He's a little bit lighter, so maybe some teams are turned off by that, but whatever. Like, you know, the consensus big board people loved him, so it's not like they're so much better at evaluation than NFL teams. So if we look above Nolan Smith, if you're saying, well, he should have been the 15th pick in the NFL draft, well, that means the Commanders, the Patriots, the Lions, the Buccaneers, the Seahawks, the Chargers, the Ravens, and so on and so forth, all these different teams, 15 different teams, were all incorrect in their assessment. And the Eagles were the only ones who were correct in their assessment. And all these teams were wrong. So what's right. the likelihood of that being true, right? Right. Much less, much less yeah, than yeah, yeah. one team being incorrect. So that's the first part of the logical part. The second part is um, the consensus big board, I think, differs the most probably from NFL big boards because of non-public information that they have that that the consensus big board does does not have. And when it comes to non-public information, the biggest things are going to be medicals, um, right. references, references are going to be a big thing. Uh, you know, talking to coaches, talking to former players, all those sorts of things. And, you know, maybe I don't I don't even see a way medicals can push someone up the board. Uh, like you can't be like, oh, his ACLs are like really strong or so, you know, supposed to be like, but right. medicals can definitely push someone down. For sure. And, and so so that again, that's that means, oh, I get it. Like there shouldn't be a reason to reach for a player because of medicals, but there should be a logical reason they fell and, th and they're not really a steal when they fall. So there's that. And I think when it comes to references, yeah, great references could probably move you up some, but I think again, it's more of a red flag situation. And when it comes to Jalen Carter, it's not only the legal issues. I think the legal issues are actually the least of the problem for Jalen Carter, because if it's not, it's not going to affect his career and, you know, We've seen with Deshaun Watson, like teams, if, if you think someone's valuable at a valuable position, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if they really care that much. I think the bigger issue was, this is stuff that's been reported after the draft because people didn't want to necessarily say it that much, is that there were just a lot of stories about, you know, coaches at Georgia and others saying that he, you know, they didn't like him. He wasn't a hard worker. He, you know, they didn't know if he right. was really in it. Um, he showed up to his pro day completely out of shape, couldn't finish his drills. Supposedly his interviews did not go well. So all these things that we don't have in the public probably moved him down. Whether they moved him down too far, I think is it's appropriate to question that. Um, but there's something to it. Like we should, we should assume the big board rating was overly optimistic for players like Carter and Nolan Smith. Uh, now seeing the feedback we've gotten from the NFL on them fascinating okay so overall though um okay so overall you don't think philadelphia necessarily excelled you should not be making super bowl plans just because of the draft and you should probably well, they never... didn't reach so it's, it's kind of one of these things where for a lot of times when it comes to the draft right. and when it comes to a lot of nfl decisions um the 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 best thing you can say or the thing you can say most often is like that's not a mistake necessarily so like if you could say that that's not necessarily a mistake that's right. good so i don't think their picks are mistakes and if they would have reached on those two picks that would be that would have been worse so right. maybe trading up was a slight mistake but generally <sighs> like i had him as having a top 10 draft but i didn't have him as number one um because of the fact that i couldn't really point to positives as much as pointing to they probably didn't make mistakes reaching on players interesting but i mean it could be a mistake on carter if they're ignoring all these references it could be, but you know they they are getting a discount. They're getting something for that, right? Like sure. They're, yeah, so yeah. They're yeah. not ignoring it. They're not ignoring the references because if they were, if they if the references were being ignored, he would probably have gone at number five at the latest. Right. Okay. So next question: If if we're trying to predict how well these players do, let's just say value of second contract compared to rookie contract, should we look at actual draft position or the consensus big boards? 
Uh, I mean, I'm only looking at actual draft position. Um, so you still, but, yeah, for the reasons you mentioned I mean, that yeah, they have more information. Yeah, I think they have information. But I do, like, again, I, I, so I broke up the draft grades into, like, three different components. Trade value, and I'm measuring that by by surplus value, where it says, like, the surplus value of the picks they gave away versus the surplus pa- value of the picks they're gaining. So there's that. The second thing was positional value. So the positional value, surplus value of that position at that pick versus the average position at that pick. And then the third thing was, like, this discipline pick, which is more really looking at reaches um, where you're discounting it somewhat, but looking at the surplus value of the, of the pick at where they picked it versus where big board said they should have picked it and then dinging them for the fact that if, if, if it's down quite a bit. So no, I, I do think you can look at the big board and use it in that way, but that's the one way that I would use it is interesting is for reaches, not for, not yeah. for uh, steals. Great. So who had the best draft by your methods? Well, the thing is, we had some huge trades. So I lumped in the Chicago Bears trade at number one as being part of this draft because, of course, yeah. Whether it was executed on when the when the Bears were on the clock or or you know two months ago, it didn't really make any difference. Um, but I did not include a bunch of some people like Evan Silva for his grades. He includes like all the player trades that have ever happened <laughs> for any pick in this draft. And it's like, I can't do that. Like I could only do what's on the clock, like what happens that's directly affecting this sort of draft. Um, and because of that, that that trade and then the trade up to three were just enormous in value. Like it just dwarfs anything else when it comes to the value game. I think there's a lot more risk in the bears trade because, you know, I don't know if they like are set with Justin Fields and trading away a quarterback right. pick exactly. is a little bit sketchy. Um, but outside of that, those two teams are at the top. And then the the third team who I would think might be actually have had the best draft when you consider what they had coming into the draft and where they were and everything else. Um, the, the Indianapolis Colts, I, I really like what they did in this draft, gaining positional value uh, going with Richardson at four, which I, you know, it's not like the, it's kind of a duh sort of play, but at least they did it. And I like Richardson as a pick, um, but they also did their normal Colts thing and traded back uh, a handful of times and never traded up and, and, were, and were generally good on positional value. So I think for, for their, for where, where, where they were, what they had going into it, um, I think the Colts might've actually had the best draft. Interesting. So, you, so because of the trades, Arizona and Chicago ended up at the top, at least the way that you're weighting things, right? Yeah, because those are just big. Those are like sixty million dollar gains in surplus value. It's huge. Fascinating. Okay, and then the third was Indianapolis. Um, I don't think it was an obvious thing that they take Anthony Richardson at four. A lot of people had Will Levis there. Poor kid that had to sit there all alone. <laughs> Not really. Yeah, I mean, it would have been slightly the worse by my numbers for for Levis, but. Uh, he had moved up quite a bit in the consensus big boards and mock drafts. I think because people thought that he was gonna <laughs> that he was gonna go there. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't have affected them that much. I guess I meant it was it was almost a no brainer to take a quarterback, and I give them a positional value boost because of that. Right. Do you like Richardson as a prospect? I do. I mean, I had him as the second. Uh, I kind of grouped it in tiers going into the draft. Uh, unfortunately I got a little bit affected by the Will Levis talk, but not that much where I had like a tier one of, of Bryce Young by himself, a second tier of Anthony Richardson by himself. And then a third tier of Stroud above Levis in the third tier. And at that point in time though, and this is what's interesting. If you look at the mock drafts, like they, they were actually better mock drafts that were collected. And this is being collected by Benjamin Robinson over at grinding the mocks. They were better a week or two weeks ago than they were the week going into the draft because all these people moved Will Levis way up and sure, CJ yeah. Stroud way down. So I thought right. Levis might actually be drafted before Stroud. So that's why I kind of put them in the same tier together. But I still didn't go as far as saying Levis above above Stroud. So no, I, I had I still had Richardson above them, and I don't think I would change that that rating for having him above Stroud. And then what goes in to how you determine these tiers? Well, it's it's a little bit of art, a little bit of science, um, a lot of art, I would say. I mean, okay. It, so it, you're it, actually giving your estimate yeah, based yeah. on production, based on film, based on production, production film. I do have some um, measures that I like to use to to try and quantify some of these ideas about processing and you know being able to deal with pressure and things like that. So the the ones that I really like are their sack rate under pressure. 
where they are with that versus where you'd expect them to be, whether or not they can scramble also to mitigate some of that. I think that's important now in the NFL. Um, And then the other thing I look at is not their, their performance under pressure, but their performance under pressure relative to their performance from a clean pocket. Um, And I found that that can, that gives you some signal there because you have some guys like Baker Mayfield, uh, to a, to a degree, some others who had like really outstanding overall numbers and pretty good numbers under pressure, but their numbers from a clean pocket were just off the charts. And I think it shows a little bit of maybe juicing up their performance because of the system and everything, the way that it was working. And when you get to the NFL, you're just not going to have it that easy in the NFL. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a couple things I want to mention, like, I mean, I know <clears throat> Matt Waldman loves, uh, Anthony Richardson action met actually has him as his QB one. And a lot of that assessment is based on as a passer. So basically ignoring all the athletic upside. So we will see how that, that turns out. And then the other thing about Will Levis is, you know, I was kind of looking at how awful Kentucky's numbers were this past season. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I realized, Oh, well he actually played the year before and the numbers were pretty incredible. And, that's that's got a lot of the signal of Josh Allen, right? <laughs> from from his Wyoming days, right? Where he was really good his junior year. His last year was like beyond awful. And I don't know, maybe if people are like seeing the similarities there. Um, I still think Josh Allen is kind of a one in a trillion kind of play that worked out, right? Uh, in terms of a guy that's improved his accuracy and, and really become a star. I don't think that necessarily works out for Levis. But what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that there's some similarities there. Um, I think there's also similarities not in that progression because Richardson only started one season. But as far as accuracy is concerned, I mean, Allen struggled with his accuracy and yeah. and so did Richardson, especially in the short area. So that would be, and athletically, that would be a helpful comp. Another guy who came up when I looked, though, at this like career progression, and I think they're, they have some similarities now. The guy I'm going to mention is Justin Herbert, but I think Herbert's better a lot was a lot better like every stage of the progression than someone like Will Levis. But I do think there's some similarities in like Herbert had some really outstanding years relative to his age when his freshman and sophomore years when then he was injured. He was he was pretty good junior year and then he kind of wasn't that good in his senior year and people really fell off. He was a player who I think if he would have come out in the 2019 draft, I think he would have been the first overall pick. Hmm. over um, Kyler Murray and he didn't come out and then somehow everyone thought that taking him at six overall was like a travesty (laughs) the next year uh, Justin Herbert even though he could have been the number one pick before and it's not the same with Levis but I do think again with Levis if he come if he came out a year earlier I don't know I feel like people would have been a little bit more positive on him he could move a little bit you know he's not a statue so I don't I I think that's a great pick for the Titans. And someone was asking me the other day, like, where would I have picked Levis? I mean, I would have been fine taking him in the in the first round or or even with the Titans pick at number 11. I mean, they took Skaronsky, who's a tackle who might end up a guard. Right. I mean, it's a guard. Like, do we really care that much about right. a guard? I don't know. It's just right, like right. I, I'm willing to take shots on these quarterbacks. And if they completely bust. Well, guess what? First round picks bust constantly. The the 49ers just lit th- three first round picks on fire to go get Trey Lance. And they're right up there with the top teams contending for the NFC. Like there's lots of things that have to go right uh, to make it to that sort of area. So I- I'm fine using draft capital on Levis. And I think maybe there's some Herbert ishness to him. Oh, everyone got completely turned off when underlying, like you mentioned in previous seasons, there were a lot of positive signs. Right. Exactly. So I'd also want to ask you who's at the bottom of your uh, your your draft grades. And and I presume Houston's down there, right? Because of what they gave up for Arizona and probably Carolina as well. Yeah, yeah. Houston and Carolina. But again, I, I'm much – I think Carolina probably gave up too much. It, like they could have tried a little bit harder, although then it would have brought into play um, – because the Texans were willing to give up, I believe – 12 and two i can't remember it was either 12 and two or a 2024 first and two <laughs> that's a lot right to move, to, up, to one move up to move up one spot so that's again one, not I think it's using two. that's not using all these uh you know valuing picks right i mean they're, they're, yeah. they're just they're throwing the charts out the window and just yeah yeah I mean, we talked about in the past by, the, yeah. the bears going up from three to two 
trading like a couple of fourths and a, or a third and a couple of fourths. Okay, this has been a, a number 12 overall pick to move up one spot. So like that, that, that I think that's what made it very, very expensive for the Panthers. But um, yeah, I, I'm okay. I, I'm they, they, they come up poorly in the numbers because of losing that trade value. But I think they more had a middle of the road sort of draft. So I would put the Texans as being the worst in this one. Um, they gained a ton of positional value because they took a quarterback and an edge rusher. Um, but in trades, they lost almost 80 million in surplus value in trades. So you net out maybe the 40 million that they gained in positional value and they go all the way down there. So I, I think they had the worst draft um, for their longer term, pros- medium to long term prospects. Right. So give me another team that's near the bottom of your analysis. Okay, so another team you want you want me to make all these uh, fan bases upset. Let yes. me see. Yes, let's do it. Uh, I mean, the 49ers, <laughs> which is weird <laughs> because they didn't have that many picks, right? Like they they trade away all their picks for Trey Lance and Christian McCaffrey, and right. then and then they pick they a kicker in the up, third round. <laughs> they trade up for a safety in the third round. Then they take a kicker. And that's just, you're just done. You're dead to me already at that point. Like those are your first two picks of the entire draft is a box safety and a kicker. Like, and then they drafted a tight end with all, there's this class is just deep with athletic, uh, elusive tight ends. You have guys who are going in the fourth and fifth round who maybe have some chance. And this tight end that they took Cameron Latu, 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 I don't uh, like he's slow and he's, I think he broke two tackles in his entire college career <laughs> out of like, out of like 70 receptions. And I guess he's a blocker or something like, where's the upside with these picks? Um, if you look at the Rams, they didn't have any draft capital, but they traded back like a billion times. And, you know, I don't know if it's great that they have like five seventh round picks or whatever, but right. at least it's trying, I feel like versus the 49ers. I think they're like, I think they look at their roster and they say, we're good. We don't have to. You know, we'll be fine this season, but I don't know. It could be could be difficult for them in a year or two, um, depending on how these players age out, if they have no good pipeline of rookie talent coming in. Yeah, and especially for – I have a couple of Niners fans uh, in town here, and I cannot wait to give them a clip of what you just said. It's going to be pretty awesome, but um, they also <laughs> note about the injury rate. I mean, I don't I, – I mean, they've had so many secondary injuries over the last yeah. – However many years, I feel like it's kind of a miracle that their defense has been so good. Obviously, you have great pass rush and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, no depth there, right? And I love yeah, Jake Moody, so have a Michigan bad. kicker. But it seems like a little bit of a reach taking him in the third round. Well, I mean, he's like the fourth kicker or something like that to ever <laughs> go on day two or earlier. Um yeah, there's just like what's the upside here? J- even if he's Justin Tucker, which he's not going to be, there's like a there's like a less than one percent chance he ends up being Justin Tucker. Um, but what if still, he is? Still, still not worth a third round pick. Um, no, it's worth a third round pick if he's Justin Tucker. I'll, I'll give you that. Okay. Okay. I'm willing to I'm willing to take that for sure. I mean, I don't know. It might even be worth a late first round pick to get Justin Tucker if you really know it's going to be Justin Tucker. The the the, the harder part is the one percent <laughs> probability that it happens. Then. If you're certain it happens, if you're certain something's going to happen, I think that's always the problem with these analyses. I remember Carson Wentz. I went insane during the Carson Wentz trade up with everyone using the same line. And I assume they still use that nowadays where they say, well, if the quarter, if it hits, then it doesn't matter what you paid for. And I'm like, no, no. It, you like that's not <laughs> if he hits, you can't do it. And it does matter. So like you're telling me if you trade away every pick for your team, for the history of the rest of your franchise, that would not matter. No, that would probably matter. If it, like there is a line, there is a line in the sand wow. you have to draw at some point. I mean, that's the ultimate outcome over process argument, right? And right, right. we're not buying that on this no, show. Definitely not. Um, awesome. I live in the greater Detroit area, and all the analytics nerds around here were so excited when they traded down. They're like, "Yes, Brad Holmes. Yes, let's go." Yeah, and then he takes a running back with the twelfth pick, banging the table. In, in his room, in his, wherever the heck he was. Yeah, and the excitement that they man. got Jameer Gibbs. He almost Gibbs. broke some dude's arm he, when he was going for like a, a high five. I thought he was going to kill that guy. I was like, that guy's got gray hair. Like, take it easy on him. <laughs> well, I think it's hilarious, Kevin, that every team, when they make a pick, they like hug it out. Like, <laughs> I know. They, I think they've it's drafted it's Patrick. It's, Mo- it's like hilarious. It's like, come on. 
I feel, I feel like you should be sweating a little bit, right? Like, well, you know, I, I sent out this video. It's not quite the equivalent thing, but I sent out a video just earlier today where the first half of the video is the is the Colts draft room when they pick us in, when they're drafting Anthony Richardson. They're all just like sitting there staring forward, like no emotion, anything else. Oh, really? Anthony Richardson. And then the second half that. of the video... The second half of the video is Brad Holmes breaking the like the professional wrestler. He's like breaking the table. He like suplexes <laughs> some guy. He's like holding on. They're hugging everybody for Jameer Gibbs at twelve. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, <laughs> it is it is crazy because I, I mean it doesn't whatever. Everyone operates differently. I think it's fine to have fun. You know, have fun. You put a lot of work into it. Um, right. But I, I do wonder how much of that is a reflection of like overconfidence in your evaluation too. When the reality is like, hey, we, we we may have made a good pick here. Like that's kind of the reality of every single situation, no matter how overcome, no matter how much work you put into the process. That is certainly not the emotion in most draft rooms for teams uh, on yeah. the night of the draft. <laughs> uh, but getting back to Detroit, they take a running back at twelve. They take a linebacker at eighteen, and then they take a tight end at uh, pretty early in the second round, uh, thirty four. So, uh, positional value, that eh, probably not great. What do you what do you think of the the Detroit's the draft? Yeah, so I'll break this out for you in the in the three different categories I have. So, uh, they came in twenty first in their ranking, so not as bad as it could have been, and that's sure. because of trade value. They gained about eighteen million in surplus value from that trade. Now, you know this maybe maybe I should look at process process over results here because the process was. We our highest player on our board is Jameer Gibbs at, <laughs> at six, and we want, or else he's way way up there. He's near the top. So once Devin Witherspoon went, they lost all their players who they wanted, and they knew they could get all? Gibbs later. Wait, uh, all the players that they wanted? I mean, well, I'm saying all the players they were they were comfortable taking at six. They were really it. hoping okay. Witherspoon would get to them. So when Witherspoon didn't, then they were like, oh, like, do we want to, I don't know where Bijan was on their board. Maybe Gibbs was, was higher because of the fact that they, they're kind of, they like to split up the backfield and everything. They already have David Montgomery and blah, blah, blah. But, um, so they, they were, they were a little bit in a panic if you listen to them, cause they, they're, they're thinking to themselves, okay, can we make this pick? Like, can we make this Jameer Gibbs pick at six? Like we really, really want to get back. So they, the Cardinals almost bailed them out a little bit. I would have loved to have seen that. Did that Jameer picks? that Jameer gives pick half at his six, it would have been so incredible. So the, but they traded back and they got the 18 million in surplus value with that trade. The thing is they lost about 22 million in positional value because of mostly because of the running back and li- and off ball linebacker in the first round. And they lost an additional 5.4 million in what I call discipline or in other words, reaching versus right. sticking with your board because Gibbs, not only was he running back at 12, he was someone who's, Big board rating actually wasn't that low. It was around. It was in. It was like in the early twenties. But Jack Campbell was the forty was forty second on the consensus right. big board I was looking at, and they took him eighteenth. So that looks like a reach, and that's why they're they're losing that. Uh, and you know what? This is actually mitigated this this the fact that they lost so much. Um, they actually gained about ten to twelve surplus value in taking a quarterback in the third round. So if they didn't take Hendon mm. Hooker in the third round, they would have been even worse off here. Although that's a pick that most people probably aren't thinking about a lot. But the thing is it doesn't work most of the time. But if it does work and Hendon Hooker is a good quarterback, I mean you're paying a guy basically a couple million dollars a year. Uh you don't need very high level of play to get a value out of that. Right. And I mean Jared Goff's probably not the answer for forever. Might be the answer now, we'll see. right? They're so. talking extension. They're talking extension there. So, well, that's what's the problem with the, I thought the Lions were not going to take a quarterback in this draft, no matter what, because of the timeline for the GM and coach. This is their, they're going into their third season. They almost made the playoffs. They were definitive going into the draft. favorite, definitive favorite in the NFC North. Well, that I may mean, be a little bit of an overstatement. But no. but you're right. They were the favorite. They no, were the favorite. I- I mean, we can check. I'll check the markets while you're How talking. much higher are they than the Vikings? I mean, the Vikings got to be like in the ballpark. Oh, really? A lot? Okay. I, I, I didn't know I'm how checking. much they were. I, I'm, I'm checking right now. But anyways, so continue like, with. So if you draft a quarterback there, if you draft a quarterback, you're probably actually hurting your odds of going to the playoffs this year. Like rookie quarterbacks sure. are not good. Um, so I, I thought they were just locked into not taking a quarterback. So this Hood and, Hood and Hooker pick could work out. But for the same reason, um, they're really, I mean, they surrounded Goff with, 
you know, Jameer Gibbs now. They already have Amon Ross St. Brown. They have, you know, Jameson Williams will be back, I guess, eventually from somewhere. Um, they got Sam Laporta at tight end, which I liked. They're like, they're going to have a lot of dudes and a good offensive line to throw. The- so Jared Goff could be playing, you know, the Lions make the playoffs. He's probably getting some sort of extension. Right. All right. You ready for the odds? Of the NFC North? Okay. Give them to me. Detroit Lions on FanDuel right now, May 4th, 2023, plus 140. Okay, yeah, and then Min- that's closer than I thought. So, I, thought they, I thought they were like 200 or something, but yeah. No, Green Bay is plus 330. Uh, Minnesota is plus 350. So so is Kevin really? Cole going to become a betting expert right now Whoa, and suggest putting that. some you money know, on the Vikings? Green Bay was last a couple weeks ago. <laughs> well, that well, was I mean, And the Bears are plus 350, right? So it's like, I mean, that, I mean that's my statement. No, but like they are definitive favorite. Like the markets right now are saying like the Detroit Lions are most likely to win this and the other three teams are like equally crap. I thought Minnesota was closer before. Maybe well maybe it's a different one. Let me look. Let me let me look on on DraftKings really cuz I thought it was closer for some reason. Why, why are you trusting those dudes? I don't know. I, just I mean, I don't really, I don't, I don't really trust FanDuel, but, no, you're but right. I trust no, it's actually, them more. It's actually, it's actually, yeah, it is pretty. It's, it's actually plus one ten for Detroit mm-hmm. versus three fifty for Vikings, three fifty for the Bears, and five hundred for the Packers. Now they're lower on the Packers. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Which I think is hilarious that the Packers are like less below the Bears. I don't, I don't get that. Like I'm lower well, on the Bears, I guess. What are we people. gonna get out of Jordan Love? Well, he's gonna be bad. There's no doubt about it. But I guess there's some hope. Like I don't know if he's going to be worse than Justin Fields, but he's he's going to he he's most likely not good. Right. So what? I mean, you're you're going to hope that 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 defense can, you know, be in the same roughly above average, you know, pretty good secondary and, you know, Matt LaFleur comes up with some scheme that, you know, keeps the offense not in the bottom 8. Yeah, no, I, I'm not saying they're going to be good. I'm just saying I'm shocked that anyone would think that they could be worse than the worst team in the NFL last year, the Chicago Bears, at least the worst record from the sure. worst team, the worst, the worst record in the NFL. That that's my shock. That's that's a little bit of my shock there. But but I think I think people are expecting Fields to be pretty good. I, I you can certainly question that, and I and I certainly will. Yeah, I certainly but, do. Yeah. Um. But I think that's the idea, right? Well, must I don't be know. if they're if they're equal to the Vikings. I mean, we know the Vikings were the most fraudulent team last year for their record. But even if they're fraudulent, it meant they were like, you know, the 18th best team instead of a great team. Um, It doesn't mean they were fraudulent. They're the worst team in the NFL type of thing. For sure. For sure. Well, good. I'm glad we're talking about betting stuff because, you know, it's my job to kind of project out the next season. How much does this draft matter for how these teams are going to perform? Not a lot. I I mean, it's going to matter much more for – Next year, the year after that, the year after that, um, typically rookies do not perform at a very high level. Of course, there are different distributions of outcomes. You know, quarterbacks is one of those things where they're typically not good. But if you get a a Dak Prescott 2016 or a Russell Wilson 2012 or an RG3 2012 type of season, you can make a a tremendously huge difference. Um, So... Not much, and I don't think odds had moved that much based upon what had happened here. Um, so yeah, that's all that's all I would say. It's not not much. Awesome, Kevin Cole. But I do think the Panthers. What do you think about the Panthers? That's another one I'm kind of intrigued by. Wait, what do you mean? What do I think about the Panthers? Well, because coming out of this draft, you know, there's so much focus on the Falcons. I've heard people say they kind of they like the Falcons to win the division, blah blah blah. Like, are the Panthers that they much like- worse than the Falcons? I wait, don't know. Wait, I mean, people at least... like the Falcons to win the division with Desmond Ritter going in as well, the starting. Well, it corner. is the Saints is the are really the only competition that are at least in their minds for that for that division. I mean, the Bucks are are kind of seen as being potentially the worst team there. So I don't know. I'm interested in the Panthers only because I feel like again with Bryce Young, you could get one of those seasons. Um, Matt Ryan, his rookie season right. was really good. Right. Uh, Baker Mayfield was pretty good in his rookie season. So if you get one of those seasons sure. from Bryce Young, I feel like they, they they should be, you know, almost favored to win the division. Personally, I know he did not have a good season last year, but I believe in Derek Carr. He's been very good except for last season. Uh I think Norland should be the favorite. Yeah, well, I'm not, they are the I'm favorite. Not, they, they are. are the favorite, yeah. But, I'm not yeah, and I'm are, not they are the favorite. You know, and like all the issues that Atlanta has had on the defensive side of the ball um you know, Carolina was uh, was actually first when when I look at like kind of explosive play rate, like things that uh, 
tend to regress pretty strongly. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'm buying Atlanta or Carolina at all as of right now. Okay, I'll, I'll stick. I'll stick with. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why I had this Carolina thing. I had this Carolina right. thing last year before the quarterback situation really, really fell apart. Where their defense was kind of like okay two years ago, and they rebuilt the offensive line. I guess they got no receivers, so that's a little bit of an issue. Right, because they traded away DJ Moore, right? So yeah, they traded away DJ Moore. They drafted uh, Jonathan Mingo. So who knows? Like that's another one. Did they? I guess they combined a couple of guys where. They're going to get a lot of snaps, you know, they're going to get a lot of play time. So maybe in some ways, like betting on the variance where the median outcomes are not good for, for, the, for this team. But maybe if you get like a couple of uh, tail outcomes out of them, that might be underappreciated. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kevin Cole. Thank you so much for joining me on the Football Analytics Show. Please let everyone know where they can find you on the internet and your site, newsletter, podcast. Sure, sure. So I'm on Twitter at Kevin Cole, triple underscore, not one, not two, but three underscores um, at the end. Maybe I'll eventually fill in. I'll fill in those three. I can't do the NFL thing. Um, so that's that's on Twitter. I have a substack, unexpectedpoints.substack.com. I put out... Uh, you know, probably a free post once a week and then at least a couple of premium uh, heavy data analysis research type of posts per week. I also do an interview podcast once a week during the middle of the week. And then if there is a news item that pops up, I'll do a live uh, YouTube stream on the YouTube channel, which I'll turn into a podcast. And then sometimes at the end of the week, I do like a Q&A kind of wrap up of the week solo podcast where I'm also taking uh, questions in the comments on YouTube. Right. You used to do the podcast, what, like these solo episodes, like an hour just yourself? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I kind of did. I kind of do that now. Um, Wait, with so these the, Q&As, it, it okay. all depends on the yeah. Q&A. But it, it, I, like I haven't been doing it for I haven't had the site for that long. So I was with PFF before, if anyone does. That's also another thing. So I was with PFF and I was doing a lot of stuff there. So everything has been transitioned at this point. So, you know, I'm building up the YouTube channel there, but it's weird because I'm getting probably like two thirds of the views that I used to get at PFF, <laughs> even though they had 200,000 subscribers. And it just shows you right. like how even people that follow PFF are not really like analytical people. They're like football people who like data a little bit. Um, but yeah, my, my type of thing is even seen as being niche amongst them. But anyway, I, I'm actually getting a better response sometimes on the live streaming stuff. And people have, have started to become accustomed to it. So I'll get, you know, sometimes I have to just shut it down after a while. Because I think I went for like an hour and 20 minutes um, on last Friday when I'm going through four, five, six, you know, 10 questions. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I can go for a while. It helps with the Q&A though, because going by myself, sometimes it feels a little weird to transition if you lose your train of thought when you don't have someone else to jump in. Awesome. Kevin, thanks again for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football Analytics Show. My name is Ed Fang, your host. I'm honored you listened until the end. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Kevin Cole as much as I did. Please check out all his work over at Unexpected Points. Just a reminder, you can get my free sports betting email newsletter. You can sign up for that free service by going over to thepowerrank.com. During this football offseason, I will continue to be doing these interviews. I really hope to be talking a little bit about baseball and golf, but you'll probably get a lot more football episodes than we've done over the past few off-seasons, so I'm really looking forward to engaging in interesting conversations so we can get ready for the 2023 season. Once again, my name is Ed Fang. I'm honored to be your host of this podcast. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>